sing this out all the earth.
more time. All the earth. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Wonder 
Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son. Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, and charged him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paden Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples, and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you, that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. Also, Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Meolath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajath to be his wife, in addition to the wives he had. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, 
a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. <laughs> then Jacob awoke from his sleep. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid. How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat, and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. The background to this story on our journey through the book of Genesis is Isaac, who's the patriarch of the faith, the son of Abraham, thought he was dying. He couldn't see very well, so in preparation for his death, he put a plan into motion to speak the blessing of the firstborn on his firstborn son. It was a legally binding thing. And to make a long story short, his brother, with the help of their mother, tricked the father into giving Jacob the blessing. Esau, being the older of the two twins, came in and discovered that his younger brother had cheated, lied, and stole, and deceived the father, and got this legally binding blessing. And he was heartbroken over it, and was angry at his brother, and planned to kill him, but wanted his dad to die first. Since it was going to be any day now, <laughs> um, he made a plan, and this helped him calm down. I'll get the blessing, I'll get the birthright if I'm the only one living, right? So it was a strategy as well as um, revenge. The mother caught wind of this, being the schemer that she is, so she told her younger son, uh, surely your brother Isaac comforts himself concerning you to kill you, intending to kill you. Now, verse 43, therefore, Genesis 27, now therefore my Son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, which is hundreds of miles away, up in Syria by Iraq, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. I don't think that's going to happen. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? So Esau being angry, not thinking very clearly, letting it be known he's going to kill his younger brother. When he does, now he's going to be guilty of murder. Then he's going to be punished for that. And the scheming mama, the mother who has favorites in the family, loses big time. Notice she says, your brother will forget what you have done to him. She didn't include herself. This, this lady was... Um, she had issues. This family had issues. Anybody know about families with issues? They had some issues. Yet God had formed a friendship with their father, Abraham, which would be her great uncle. And God is true to his word. So no amount of human frailty and failures is going to back him off of his plan. He would just use it. 
in the long run. So here's Jacob, not able to enjoy the blessings that's been uh, bestowed upon him, gained by deceit, because he has to run for his life. And then Rebekah, to help the father get behind this, complains about Esau's wives, says, I'm weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. They were Hittite girls. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth like these, who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? He married, you know, a couple neighbor girls. So he was a bigamist. He's about to become a trigamist. So Isaac calls Jacob and blesses him again and tells him, you, you won't take one of the girls of this land. Go to Padan Haram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So he's going to marry his first cousin. Like I said, um, he had issues. And then here comes this blessing. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger which God gave to Abraham. So Jacob leaves. Esau overhears this that his parents aren't happy with his wives like he didn't know. (laughs) So he chooses someone else, someone also from the family, one of Uncle Ishmael's daughters, another first cousin, to be a wife. So we don't know how she turned out for him. But anyway, so Jacob leaves from Beersheba, verse 10 of chapter 28, and he goes toward Haran. It's a long journey. Here's a map. And his first stopping place it looks like he walked a long time is Luz which means the almond tree and it gets named Bethel because of this experience that he has Bethel means a house of God he's tired and uh, he finds a place to rest and takes a stone and uses it as a pillow maybe he had some fabric that he wrapped around it or put under his head but it was a place where he could roll over on his side and his head won't just you know won't wake up with a neck ache And he dreams while he's sleeping on that stone pillow and uh, sees a ladder that was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending, going up, getting assignments, coming down, fulfilling assignments. So he sees this heavenly traffic, but he hears God who's above this ladder who speaks to him. Now, this has been called Jacob's ladder. It's really God's ladder. It's the angelic ladder. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to sing, I am climbing Jacob's ladder, ladder, I am climbing. You, you ever, anybody sing that as a kid? Jacob's ladder, ladder, I am climbing Jacob's ladder, ladder, soldiers of the cross. Don't you think I make a real good soldier? Don't you think? Did you sing that part? Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. You know where that song came from? The slaves sang it during the Civil War. There's a cadence to it. They would sing it a little slower. Uh, If you Google it on YouTube, there's a recording of it that is so powerful it'll give you goosebumps, man, of this house full of, of, uh, no doubt it was a black church, singing it the way they did back in the day. Powerful song. But this isn't a ladder for Jacob to climb. This is a ladder for angelic activity. This is a vision of heavenly things. If you Google Jacob's ladder, you'll find an exercise device where you can lose weight by going up and down this ladder like Jacob did. Well, he didn't go up and down the ladder, but it's God's ladder. And God says to him, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac. See, God has added to his name. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Verse 14, also your descendants shall be on the dust, be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's that seed promise. Blessing to the world through his seed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you 
wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Jacob wakes up and says, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. He said, and I did not know it. This is where he has his spiritual awakening. Like his father and grandfather, he had an encounter with God. This promise was echoed to him that they had received. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This verse is where Robert Morris got the name for Gateway Church, not just because it's by the gateway to the Metroplex, you know, the airport, but every church wants to be a connection with heaven, do we not? We want to be an expression of the house of God in the earth. So he gets up early in the morning, takes the stone that he'd had as a pillow, laying on its side, stands it up on the end, and pours oil on it, and names it, that space, Bethel. Beth-el, the house of God. And he makes a vow, and he says, if God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I may come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. So he had had an awesome experience. Wakes up and makes this commitment. And then stands the stone up that had been his pillow, pours oil on it, and dedicates it to the Lord. And he said, this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I shall surely give a tenth to you. Like his grandfather who tithed, uh, gave 10% of his blessings to the priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, he makes a commitment to tithe. So it starts out, tithing starts out as an expression of love to God. There is no law commanding it or regulating it. This is pre-law in the story. This is the roots of our faith. This is where tithing to the house of God began. Right here. Isn't that amazing? And God has been blessing that practice ever since. I'd like to talk to you for the next few moments on the house of God. Can we say the house of God? The house of God is a theme in the scriptures. Psalm 23 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 26, 8, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Psalm 27, 4, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He continues in verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. It's amazing how many times the word rock, rock, stone, stones are used in expressing our faith. Psalm 8410, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Psalm 9213, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. And another psalm says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The house of God is a place of restoration. Here, Jacob falls asleep and is going to get this revelation of the house of God, but he's tired physically, so his physical strength is going to be restored. He's tired mentally, emotionally, it's going to be restored, but also spiritually, he is going to be restored back to this encounter with God like his father and grandfather had. Jacob went out from Beersheba, went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head 
and he laid down in that place to sleep. Can we say restoration? The house of God is a place of revelation. He gets an incredible revelation. He dreams, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Was it a ladder, ladder like we know of, or maybe it was a stairway, a staircase, escalator, a ziggurat, a spiral staircase? We don't know. Artists have had fun with it, trying to picture what it was like. The point is, it was an extension from heaven to earth. Now keep this in mind. Jacob had been a bad boy, right? He had lied to his father, deceived his dad, dishonored him, and definitely put a wedge in the family. And he could try to hide behind his mama all he wanted, but he's a grown man. He's actually an older man, over 60 in this story. He should know better than this stuff. Who knows? We're never too old to sin, right? Yes, but wasn't he promised to be, you know, the leader in the family? Yes, he was. When the babies were in their mother's womb, Rebecca heard God say, the older is going to serve the younger. So she knew that. But in this story, she's going to help God out. You ever have a word from God and then make a mess of things trying to help him out? You ever try to open a rose before it's time to bloom? You just make a mess. You ever try to make potato salad with potatoes that aren't fully cooked? Doesn't work. The family's not happy. The Lord says to him, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth. Doesn't this sound like what he told Abraham? You will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, there is a theology out there in the church world that's called replacement theology. That God is through with the Jews. They're just like anybody else. And uh, why do we care about what happens in the land of Israel? Well, I beg your pardon, but God made promises to Abraham. Was God a liar? He made promises to Isaac. He made promises to Jacob. And you may say, yeah, but the Jews blew it. You know, they did wrong. Well, those guys did wrong. We're turning over all the stones in their story as we journey through this book, and yet God didn't back off of his promise because he made the covenant by himself. Abraham was asleep. Jacob is asleep. God's true to his word. Well, what about the gospel? Well, everybody needs the gospel, right? But we're dealing with an earthly promise that's a sign to the world there is a God. And you can fight and plot and scheme against them all you want, but there is Israel like a stick in their eye. Deal with it. He says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now, is God a liar? No. He speaks the truth, and he was true to Jacob and true to his children. The house of God is a place of realization. Now, if God has given you revelation, it needs to be realized. In other words, it needs to be applied to your situation. If you have a revelation that God's not going to leave you, but then you worry about where breakfast is going to come from tomorrow, you haven't let that revelation become realized. If he's not going to leave me, then there's nothing to worry about. Obviously, you pray about things that concern you. You cast all your cares on him, but you realize that. And so Jacob, who has been condemned, no doubt by himself, suffering with the pain of regret, the whole thing blew up. He doesn't know it. He's never going to see his mom again. She's thinking it's a few days. 20 years later, he comes back, and she's already dead. Isaac's still alive. And yet God in his mercy extends this revelation to him. Doesn't that remind you like Jesus? He extends his love to us. He wakes up from his sleep and says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. He was afraid. 
great respect came upon him. And he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Then he rises early in the morning, takes a stone, sets it up as a pillar, pours oil on it, and names it Bethel, the house of God. So you see churches named Bethel? This is the story behind it. The house of God is a place of rededication. Here he's dedicating himself to God, but he's going to come back to this place years later and rededicate. So in our lives, these are things that the house of God are to be. He makes a vow. He's dedicating. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. It sounds like he's making a deal. Okay, God, if you do this, then you're going to be my God. But I kind of understand it as the Lord's going to do these things. He's going to prove himself to me, and he's going to be my God. And it happened. It happened. God became the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. My dad, his favorite sermon was to preach about Jacob. Said, I'm glad he's the God of Jacob. God of Abraham, I understand that. Great man of faith. God of Isaac, I understand that. Great man of peace. He would dig wells and people would come and take him away from him. He'd just move on, no problem. But Jacob was a rascal. That gives hope for me. We used to sing a song years ago. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you're my God, too. Very good. This stone I have set up as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. He turns it into an altar, a place of commitment, a place of sacrifice, a place of dedication. What does that have to do with me, you may think? What does this have to do with me? Well, the house of God has everything to do with you. The house of God is not a church building. I know as parents we like to tell our kids, don't run in God's house. We really don't need to do that because God doesn't live in a building made with hands. He lives in the hearts of people. He lives in our lives, right? So, As members of the household of God, that's another way of saying the church, the assembly, the family, the body of Christ. It's a place of restoration. What does it have to do with you? Do you ever need restoration? Maybe you messed up. The Lord wants to restore you, and he uses his house to do it. Maybe you haven't wandered far from the Lord. You've been faithful to the house of the Lord all your life, but when some... (laughs) <laughs> stray comes in we don't condemn we receive with open arms and help strengthen and help restore because that's what the house of god is a place of restoration it's a place of revelation a place where we gain understanding a place where we're reminded of what we already know the place where we are exhorted and edified and comfort and it's a place of realization where we leave to apply the word to our houses at home May God make our houses, our families, houses of God. All working together as one house. God has one house, as one body of Christ. A place of rededication. Sometimes you just, the cares of life get in there and steal the word and you realize, you know, I'm I'm off the straight and narrow. I'm not walking in my calling. I'm sidetracked or distracted. Rededicate. Well, I wore my rededicator out. Well, get a new one. Get restored. What about us? May Generations Church be an expression of the house of God in this part of the world. Paul wrote to a house of God leader, Timothy, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth. He turned the pillow into a pillar. 
we turn our lives of rest, relaxation, self-centeredness, distraction into devotion to the Lord. All that stuff's just a mist that will go away. But we devote ourselves to that which is eternal. The house of God is important because it's where God's judgment begins. The time has come, Peter wrote, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? So it may seem to you sometimes God is hardest on his people. Well, he has to be. We're his children, right? You don't spank the neighbor's kids. He disciplines us with his word. Sometimes he disciplines us by letting us reap what we sow, but he wants us to learn. But trust me, do not envy evildoers. The day is coming. The day is coming. But now it's time for us. So we talked about what about me? What about us? What about Jesus? Where does he fit into this? Pastor, I thought we were looking at the roots of the faith. This has everything to do with the roots of the faith. Look at this little story from John chapter 1, the last few verses. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You will see heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus is the stone. He is the pillar. He is the gateway to heaven. He is God's ladder extended. Ladders are amazing things. They help you get up to places. They help fire and rescue people. Uh, if, you're, if you fall through the ice, wasn't that quite an experience we had here a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago? If you ever fall on the ice, a fireman comes to get you, he's going to extend the ladder out over the ice and hopefully distribute the weight. I've seen it happen. They're great tools, but they're great metaphors for Jesus. He reaches us where we need to be reached. He's like the rock that Jacob rested on. He's building his house on the rock, his church. So on this rock I'll build my church. The rock is the truth of who he is. He's God's ladder from heaven. He is the seed promised to Jacob who would bless the families of the world. Like Jacob experienced, Jesus gives his grace to those who are unworthy. He extends. You know, when he started what's called the Sermon on the Mount, he started it with blessings. It's called the Beatitudes. Bless, 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 bless. But what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with us? What does this have to do with Jesus? That's what we've tried to cover. In conclusion, what does this have to do with now? It has a lot to do with now. The season that we've come through, it's been a year now. The last time we met before the you know, ep epidemic caused us to want to comply to the governor's orders, and we didn't meet till the end of May. And our was our first public meeting at the tabernacle there on the square. 
But during this season that our nation has been in, pollsters say 40% of America's churchgoers aren't going back. They lost their commitment to the house of God. Now, how do they know that? I don't know how they know that. I actually don't really believe that. Because our experience here is people have been very committed uh, to join us online, very committed to continue to give to the house of God and their tithes and their offerings. But where is your commitment to the house of God? We're ultimately talking about commitment to Jesus. But there is no real commitment to Jesus if you don't want to have anything to do, do with his people. John said, if you can't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you've not seen? So we are the expression of Christ's life in the earth. There's two Greek words, sozo and soma. Sozo means salvation. Sozo has everything to do with God rescuing us, restoring us, healing us, delivering us. Soma means body. We're the soma of Christ. Soma is an instrument for expressing life. Your life is expressed through your body. If your body dies, you no longer are visible to us, and we no longer can receive any expressions of your life because you need it in the earth realm to express your life, right? Well, Christ rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and gave us an assignment and filled us with his spirit to express his life and his body in the earth. That's the house of God in operation as we close with worship i just want to pray a prayer for us that we would be rededicated if we need to be to the house of god can we do that lord i thank you for your word i thank you for this amazing story i thank you lord that you are the latter i thank you lord that you did extend yourself to us and gave your life for us lord we pray in the mighty name of jesus that if there's anyone here that needs to dedicate themselves to your house where maybe they never have or they have, because of the circumstances of our life, Lord, they have fallen away from that. Lord, I pray that you'd bring restoration, revelation, and realization to them today, Lord, as we walk in rededication. Amen. God bless you.
begin the service with a time of ministry. As we continue singing, can I have some people join me across the front here to pray for folks? If you'd like to receive prayer about anything, we're here to pray prayers of agreement with you. Can we do that? Come on up. If you need prayer, amen. Clothed in rainbows. to extend his love to people that are not worthy. It may be hard. Maybe somebody that has hurt you deeply in some way, just extend the love of God. Just, just go for it. Amen? May the Lord use us as the instruments of his peace in the earth. The Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Go get him, tigers. God bless you.